So the Upper Jordan. Now when I mean Upper Jordan, there's, this is kind of a soft transition because there are beaver dams in what I would consider the Upper Jordan. But really, I guess what I mean is it's kind of from the fishery, a little bit north of the fishery, our fisheries gauge, if you remember that location, upward. And I'll actually show you a map again in a minute. This image is the map source of the Jordan River, which actually, I mean, you can see this great from the highway. If you look off, so this is Marker Farms, and this is the sign. Um, if you look off, you can see the Jordan River Valley in its inception. And, and I mean, this line, I mean, terminates in this barn. I, that's, I don't know who drew the line, but... This is the Warner Creek, which flows in, and eventually becomes the deer. And um, so this is a quarter section irrigated farm. This is a quarter section irrigated potato farm on M32. There's been a dramatic increase in irrigation since 1981. We looked at the 1981 aerial imagery, and we saw no evidence whatsoever of center pivot irrigation. And that's, the, that's really the only type of irrigation that's, that, is, uh, that I believe, anyway, is feasible in this, in this system. So these were unirrigated fields. This agrees with the, the broader Michigan-wide data. Um, in the 1980s, probably only 25% of the fields in, across the state were irrigated. By 2001, that was up to 82%. Here is a 2006 aerial image, and you can see these center pivot fields. If you zoom in, this field right here has 11 center pivot wheels. So this is, a, a, this is two thirds of a section. So this is a very large center pivot farm. And right here is the Jordan River. So here's the width of the center pivot farm, and that spans the entirety of the Jordan River. So, I mean, we're talking a half of a mile from here to here. And the total, the sum total of irrigated area within the groundwater shed in 2006 is 20 square kilometers. The sum total of irrigated area within the surface watershed is like 0.5 square kilometers, or maybe point, maybe 0.3. There's like two or three irrigated farms that are kind of further up. So all of this is outside of the surface watershed. But it's all, all of the irrigation that we mapped within, within the man, on the Mansolino Plain is in the watershed of the Jordan River. And as part of a separate project, we've actually been measuring uh, nitrogen levels, nitrogen and phosphorus levels around the entire state. And I meant to have the graphic, but it's one of the things I forgot here. And the, the Jordan River is anomalous in that it has a, a relatively high nitrogen concentration. It's the only river actually in northern Michigan that's not heavily agriculturally dominated that has high nitrogen concentrations, but it has low phosphorus concentrations. And what this tells us is that because phosphorus doesn't move very easily through the groundwater, that you're getting a nitrogen contamination source via groundwater to the, the Jordan River. And moreover, we sampled both upstream and downstream of the fishery, and it's there upstream too and it gets diluted as you go downstream. So what we find then, in terms of concentration, what we've inferred from that is it's the activities that the potato farmers will apply around 180 to 200 pounds per acre of fertilizer, and then they'll irrigate around, say, maybe 12 inches a year. I mean, this is a number that can be contested on a very coarse sediment. And so a lot of this fertilizer washes its way down into groundwater and then enters the Jordan River. So here's what, how irrigation reduces upper Jordan flows. So here's a center pivot system. Here, half a mile away, is the Jordan River. This is, in that case, the one I just showed you. Here's your pre-pumping water table. I'll point out that this is the surface watershed. This is the ground watershed. It extends out to the groundwater divide, which was prior to pumping right there. They turn this thing on, and it draws down the water table, and that reduces flows to the Jordan River. This pumping occurs primarily outside the surface watershed, but inside the ground watershed, as I mentioned. A typical irrigation event for a quarter section farm may last around seven days, continuously operating 24 hours a day, and will withdraw around 8 million gallons of water. So a quarter section farm would be the marker farm, and they'll, they'll run these things continuously for seven days, which would require, in this case, it would require two pumps running at 400 gallons a minute, or one at 800 gallons a minute. And this is right at the point where the Jordan River forms. So this is going to respond within minutes of turning on those pumps. And that's a lot of water for an, an, essentially an infant stream. So this is something that absolutely is having an impact. And I'm portraying it a little bit badly, but of course, this is a, it's a fairly important part of the economy as well. If we estimate the impacts of this, that this has on discharge, I made some assumptions because, as I'll show you in a second, the actual irrigation model isn't quite yet running. Um, we have 12 inches per year of irrigation. If I assume that 40% in, infiltrates back to the water table, and I actually think this is generous, I think it's probably less. Then if we look at Webster Bridge, we're talking about a 2.5% reduction in flow, so a reduction of 4.2 CFS. 
This is on an annual average basis. At Graves Crossing, it goes up to about 3%, but at Fisheries Gauge, it's at 10.5%. This is on an annual average. These, they only pump in, the, in June, and this is only you know, a mile away from Fisheries Gauge. The real seasonal impacts are likely much larger, particularly in the mid to upper channel. And these lower flows mean that sand accumulates in the channel. It, it, what normally has a, the, the capacity and competence to move sand no longer does, or at least not as much, because of reduced flows. We're, we're developing simulations within our software for this. I wrote a new irrigation module. It calculates the ETU losses, so I don't have to assume any numbers. Um, allows, it calculates the delay in the return flow, which allows me to calculate the, the, uh, the time to, to respond to the nutrients. And as a dynamic response to the stream continuously along its length, so we can get a whole picture. And it was going to be great. The results will be ready for the final project. <laughs> final project report. A river will always erode it will always erode until it hits something that it can no longer erode. The Colorado River is cutting down and eroding through solid sandstone. And in some in some cases it's hit like volcanic um, volcanic rocks, metamorphic rocks. They're incredibly resistant and yet it cuts through them. The Jordan River is eroding sand from its banks and from its its bed. That is where the sand is coming from. It's not washing in, it's not externally sourced. The Jordan River doesn't have the ability to get sand from its bank, from, from overland flow, because it, it does not run off. With the, exception, with the exception of in the wintertime, when the ground is frozen, you actually can get runoff events, but because there's so much forest cover and you get a lot of snow, the ground, the ground doesn't, fr doesn't freeze that way. And even then, that tends to not be high sediment loads. So the sand is all from the channel. Now, as far as what part of the channel generates most of it, I don't have an answer to that. I have ideas about how to approach it that I don't have the equipment to address, but are some, some cool ideas that, that I've talked about with people. So the sand is banks and bed. As to how it got there in the first place, like what sand are we eroding? Are we eroding disturbed sand from logging activities versus sand that was always there? and has been steadily eroding because that's what rivers do until they return to their base level of the ocean? I don't know the answer to that question. But it, the sand is from the river itself, from its banks and its bed. So the sand is all coming from the Jordan River itself, from its landscape immediately within like inches of itself. It's undercutting its banks a little bit, it's cutting down by a little bit every year, and it's moving that sand along. And it doesn't take a lot of, it doesn't take a lot of change, it takes just a couple inches for you to get hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of, of sediment that show up in your harbor. So, summary conclusions. So, one is, if you have experiences on the Jordan River, take our survey. We would really like to, to hear from you. I think it's a really interesting opportunity for, um, for people to contribute to science in a way that's not just like gathering some things and collecting data, but actually providing data. And it's a really interesting model that we would like to be successful because we think it would be a, a a way of, of sort of collecting people's observations in a way that we can then make them systematic and, and, and data that we can use for our models and our model development. And nobody knows the system better than the people who've lived, lived here their whole lives, so, or, or vacation here, or whatever. So just the broad outlines on the stream characteristics. We did not identify any rocky gravel. I've been told in conversations that there is some in the Jordan River. We just didn't find it. Um, Everything has been concretions. Everything we've picked up has been concretions. Um, there's little evidence of large cut bank erosion. So this is a very active erosion process in a lot of places in Michigan, but you don't see it here. The down cutting is the most likely source of sand is in terms of the dominant source. Um, and then uh, undercutting on the banks is also, uh, is also a source. And I, I meant to do a back of the envelope calculation just for relative scale of those, and, and I, didn't, um, I didn't do that. The, uh, the ILHM simulations show that post de deforestation, the Jordan River flows were likely much higher, increasing the capacity to move sand. So we have two things. We observe sand on the bed, right? That's, it's accumulated sand. And then we have sand moving through the system. And there, there are different problems. If you slow the river down, the river can't move as much sand and it can accumulate more. It, of course, has less to bring in from upstream. But if it's sand along, its, along much of its length, then it can accumulate that sand as the, as the velocity drops. Um, and as it increases, it can then move that sand away. Even though there may be a continuous source of it, it can continue to move that sand out of the system. Um, so perhaps during the post-deforestation period, we're looking at something like 10% higher flows, 
we were looking at a Jordan River that had more capacity to move its sand away and scour its, <laughs> scour its bed down, um, down to, toward that, uh, uh, the concretions or, or whatever was armoring the bed. It is also possible that there's a lag gravel deposit, that lag meaning that it was left behind after glacial uh, processes and it was eroded down over years and years and years. We just haven't seen any evidence for that. Uh, and I'll note that modern land use is actually similar to pre-settlement in much of the surface watershed. It's just that, or at least the, the, the upper Jordan, the mid to upper Jordan part, it's that ground watershed that, that differs quite a bit. And then the whole Warner Deer system looks quite a bit different as well. Um, so in, in summary, the, the lower channel is responding to the Great Lakes level fluctuations in a really intimate way. It's, um, it's connected, and it was connected through human activity, and it's not going to be separated again anytime soon. So, um, so the, the harbor is going to have to respond. The, the harbor will just have to be dredged. That's, that, is, it's, that is what it will do. Um, and in the middle channel, we're looking at large woody debris accumulation that has led to shallow complex channels. They may have been shallow and complex to begin with, but we believe through aerial photo evidence that it's more so not. So whatever state <coughs> it was left in after logging activities and after marginal farming, and then was allowed to, to reforest and go through that natural succession process, we believe that that has led to an increasing in complexity in the channel, which slows the flow down and allows some of that sand to accumulate um, when it may not have otherwise done so. Beaver activity accumulates sediment behind dams and puts large woody debris into the river. So beavers have two different roles that they play in, in the watershed. And that their populations have expanded very significantly uh, since, since 1970. In the upper channel, we have an explosion. I thought I'd try to think of the last dramatic word, but a dramatic increase. I think I might have actually said that somewhere else. So anyway, an irrigated acreage after 1980 has decreased flows in the upper channel significantly potentially allowing sand to accumulate. This potentially is something that we can actually put a number on. Um, but we don't have that number here today. So thank you. And we've, we've, we've done some questions. And uh, yeah, so I guess we can move on with the, the broader discussion or follow up on these questions. I think that's